Easter Sunday, a series of explosions targeting churches. Bomb blasts in Sri Lanka, killing worshipers and high-end hotels popular with tourists also targeted. <laughs> The death toll, which includes Americans rising from near simultaneous explosions, the devastating scenes inside houses of worship, and the hunt for the killers this morning. Easter Sunday services, Pope Francis celebrating mass in front of the faithful. What he said about the attacks in Sri Lanka and a difficult Easter Sunday in Paris as well, as it's all quiet at Notre Dame for the first time in nine centuries. Tiger attack, a zookeeper attacked inside the tiger's pen right in front of visitors. The tiger is still next to them, still attacking. How she's doing this morning and what will happen now to the tiger. Search for AJ, the missing five-year-old, and a mother's plea. I just want my kids, that's all I, that's my life, they're my kids. The overnight vigil as his parents reportedly are no longer cooperating with the investigation. And dragged by a train, the woman caught in a door falling onto the tracks. She was dragged for like 15 feet, easy. What San Francisco officials are saying about those doors this morning. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Good morning and happy Easter, everyone. I wish we had happier news to report on this morning that has so much meaning for so many Americans. Sadly, the news is not good. A series of bomb attacks in the country of Sri Lanka, an island nation off the coast of India. The explosions targeted churches as well as hotels frequented by Western tourists. Here's what we know as we come on the air. There were eight explosions. More than 190 people are dead, including at least two Americans. Hundreds more are injured. The country's defense minister says seven suspects have been arrested. Nobody has claimed responsibility. Meanwhile, here in New York City, police say there are no specific credible threats to churches here, but they are monitoring the situation. We have team coverage, our security experts standing by, but let's start with ABC's Julia McFarlane in our London Bureau. Julia. Good morning, Eva. Horrific news emerging this Easter Sunday morning. Scores of Sri Lankans and tourists among the dead. This morning, eight explosions, rocking churches and luxury hotels in Sri Lanka, killing and injuring many on this Easter Sunday. At least two Americans counted among the dead. Two of the near simultaneous explosions believed to have been carried out by suicide bombers, according to the Associated Press. The scene inside St. Sebastian's Church, catastrophic. Blood spattered on the ceiling and walls. Worshippers draped over the pews. People scrambling to help one another amid the glass and debris. Outside of St. Anthony's Shrine in the capital, Colombo, the damage significant. Glass on the ground, the blood of worshippers who came to church to celebrate Easter Mass spattered on this statue of Jesus. A horrifying, powerful sight for those who survived. Several luxury hotels were also targeted. The Cinnamon Grand, the Kingsbury and the Shangri-La in Colombo. Officials telling ABC News a number of foreigners are among the dead. Other hotels across the country now tightening security amid ongoing fears. Ambulance after ambulance rushing to local hospitals, medics desperate to save the injured. Sri Lankans this morning stunned and tearful. Hundreds lining to give blood, so many that some hospitals are having to turn volunteers away. Sri Lanka has been at peace for many years since the end of its civil war. This horror punctures not only a period of calm, but also this most joyful of Christian celebrations. Eva? And Julia, Pope Francis celebrating Easter at the Vatican this morning, mentioning the attacks in Sri Lanka. Yes, that's right. Pope Francis, he referenced Sri Lanka right at the top of his Easter greeting, saying, I learned with great sadness the news of the attacks in Sri Lanka today. I wish to show my affection to the Christian community there, struck whilst gathered together in prayer, and to the victims of all such cruel violence. Now, over in Rome, security is always very tight this time of year, but sadly, the church has been targeted on Easter before. We've seen such attacks in Egypt and Pakistan in recent years. Eva? Julia McFarlane in London. Thank you, Whit. 
All right, Eva, joining us now from Washington is Brad Garrett, a former FBI special agent and ABC News analyst. Brad, thanks for being with us. We do appreciate it. Of course, we're still awaiting more details about these attacks, but we know the eight blasts were sophisticated, targeting churchgoers and tourists on Easter Sunday. What does that tell investigators? Well, it tells them, obviously, that this attack is probably toward Christians uh, and that they targeted places where foreigners, going to be probably a number of British uh, citizens that were on Sri Lanka at the time. So this is to make a statement that, look, we're going after you, the religion. And Brad, for some Americans who might not be as familiar with Sri Lanka, this is a country that has recently experienced civil war. What can you tell us about that and whether security services would have been prepared for an attack like this? Okay, so Sri Lanka got their independence in the late 1940s from the, from the British. Uh, they've had this ongoing civil war with the Tamil Tigers, which are primarily Hindu. Uh, and this has gone off and on for literally decades. Uh, there is a thing called the State Intelligence Service that's had its own issues with corruption. Uh, and so my guess is this may have caught them blindsided. The NYPD here at home, other departments saying that there is no specific threat here, but how might U.S. law enforcement agencies monitor and respond when something like this happens abroad? There's always a concern of copycats, because let's face it, if these were explosions, let's say they're, they're suicide bombers, which my guess is at least some of them would be, it doesn't take much to plan that. And so a little additional security will basically deter somebody from going in perhaps with, with a suicide vest or a bomb. And a lot of information still coming in this morning. Brad Garrett from Washington, we appreciate your insight. Thank you. Thank you, Witt and Brad. We're going to turn now to a difficult Easter Sunday in another part of the world, Paris, France, where they're recovering, as we all know, from the devastating fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral. ABC's David Wright is right there. David, good morning to you. Happy Easter, Dan. A beautiful sunny day here in Paris, but a sad note as well. That Grand Cathedral Notre Dame is where the Archbishop of Paris had planned to celebrate Easter Mass along with thousands of the faithful. Sadly, not possible now for what may be the first time in more than 850 years. Today, like Christ's tomb, Notre Dame is empty. Inside it, the Golden Cross and the Virgin Mary standing vigil all alone a scene of devastation. This building is dedicated to uh, the Virgin Mary and she's still protecting our people. She's the patron saint of our country, of our city, and she's going to help us to be able to rebuild it. Easter is all about renewal. Today, across town at the Basilica of Saint-Sulpice, an emblem of that. This is Paris's second biggest church, a Baroque masterpiece completed in the 18th century. Barely a month ago, an arsonist tried to burn it down. Today, Parisians are there by the thousands for Easter Mass. Here in France, the cultural significance of Notre Dame, more so than the religious, is on many people's minds. Among them, this woman, who took part in a flash mob tribute to Notre Dame. It's important for me because I, I can play the violin. I can, I can do what I can do. I can't do everything. I can't be, rebuild the roof. I, I, I'm not rich. I can't give a lot of money. So I'm doing what we're doing, what we can do. The orchestra, gathered outside this weekend, played Beethoven's Ode to Joy and the Marseillaise. That is, of course, the French national anthem, a rousing song. In a sign that things are getting back to normal here, this weekend also saw a return of the Yellow Vest protesters. These are massive protests that have broken out almost every Saturday for the past six months. Many of the protesters now say that they're angry that the city politicians and big business are promising big donations to rebuild Notre Dame, but are not yet addressing their concerns. Eva? All right, David, right for us in Paris. Well, now to the terrifying moments at a zoo in Kansas. An experienced zookeeper attacked by a tiger in front of visitors. ABC's Zachary Keish is in Topeka with the latest. Good morning, Zachary.
Good morning, Eva. The, the zoo is waking up here in Topeka. There's uh, elephants looking at us just over here. There's a hippo about 10 feet in front of me here. But the real focus this morning is this tiger's pen. Truly a miracle. A 275 pound tiger pounced on a zookeeper yesterday. Both are okay. That's the good news. But the big question is, what went wrong? This morning, a zookeeper is in stable condition after the tiger she was caring for attacked. Yes, getting attacked by a tiger. Officials say Sanjeev, an endangered Sumatran tiger, was in an outdoor area when he pounced on the woman. A small group of zoo visitors watched in shock. The by staff is still in the enclosure. The tiger is still next to them, still attacking. That's when three zoo employees came to a rescue, using food to lure the animal into an enclosed space. The zoo issued an immediate emergency, first clearing out the area, then dispatching firearms and tranquilizer teams. Some of our staff witnessed some things that uh, you hope you go through a career without witnessing. Officials say the victim suffered lacerations and puncture wounds to the back of her head, neck, and arm. Quite frankly, she's very lucky to be alive. Experts say something went wrong adding that the close proximity between the animal and caregiver runs against standard operating procedures. The zoo has been adamant they have no plans to kill the animal. Sanjeev uh, this morning did exactly what a tiger would uh, when something comes into its territory. Earlier this year in North Carolina, a lion attacked and killed 22-year-old Alex Black, an intern at an animal conservation center. Those of us who work with these animals need to always be on the top of our game. One lapse of judgment, one slip of not being sharp, and it could end tragically. That tiger is one of the most endangered animals on the planet. He's also been a fixture around the zoo here, and he's the father of four new cubs. Now, as far as the zookeeper goes, we're being told that she is in stable condition. Dan? That is good to hear. Zachary Keish, thank you so much for your reporting this morning. We're going to move on now to politics. And we are getting a sense of President Trump's mood as he and the rest of the nation absorb the Mueller report. From Mar-a-Lago on Saturday, Trump retweeted this note from one of his aides, Dan Scavino, and it said, I'm with the president at the Southern White House. I've never seen him happier. So let's bring in ABC's Martha Raddatz, who's in Washington, where she'll be co-hosting this week later this morning. Martha, uh, does Trump feel like he's out of the woods here? And is he really? Well, I, I, you see tweets like that, but then you see other tweets with, from the president over the past few days saying the Mueller report was crazy, uh, saying some of the things in the Mueller report were BS. So I would say that he is being a little defensive as well and does not feel he's completely out of the woods because, of course, you have uh, many Democrats who are saying uh, they need to further investigate. They need to get Bob Mueller up there. They need to get Attorney General uh, Bill Barr up on on the Hill to explain the redacted portions and why he made uh, a, a determination that there was no obstruction of justice when there are 11 examples that could potentially be that. Plus, we learned in the report that uh, Mueller's investigation is spinning off 14 other criminal investigations, 12 of which we don't even know what the content is yet. So, but let me exactly. let, let me ask you something. You and I were talking a little bit on email before before you came on the air this morning, and and we're discussing the fact that lost in all of the political toing and froing here is the fact that the report really does paint a compelling and disturbing picture of the extent to which Russia interfered and meddled in our election. What are your thoughts on that now that you've had a few days to absorb the report? Dan, it is really astonishing, and I think none of us can lose sight of what the Russians did in our election. Of course, their goal was to disrupt the election, divide the country, and to get Donald Trump elected. They did this through social media, reaching tens of millions of people on social platforms. They actually had operatives coming into the United States to gather intelligence on our country, on our political process, and tried to react to that. And of course, they hacked into Democratic emails, the DNC, the DCCC. All of these things, they said, the Trump campaign did not really alter the election, but it's something that Mueller pointed out very strongly that they tried, and sometimes the Trump campaign was receptive 
to Russian offers to help. As you know, they cleared him of any conspiracy to conspire or any of his aides with the Russians, but still a very disturbing report about what Russia was trying to do to us. Yeah, and the question is, will they try it again? Will the Chinese? How vulnerable are we? Big questions to address as we move forward. Martha, thank you. And I want to remind everybody, you're going to want to keep it here on ABC throughout the morning because Martha's got a big show coming up on this week later this morning. She's going to go, she's going to go one on one with counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, plus the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Adam Schiff. He's going to respond. That's all coming up on this week right here on ABC. Eva, over to you. All right, thanks, Dan. Now to new allegations against Boeing. The New York Times reporting workers at a plant in South Carolina have complained about shoddy work on the 787 Dreamliner. This, as the airline manufacturer continues to face scrutiny over its 737 MAX plane. This morning, a blistering New York Times report now putting Boeing's 787 Dreamliner plane under scrutiny. Some of the most important whistleblowers and former employees that we talk to are managers. The Times reporting a culture that often valued production speed over quality in Boeing's state-of-the-art South Carolina plant, forcing a frenzied production schedule to deliver planes on time. The New York Times reporting workers were pressured not to report violations, even when faulty parts have been installed in planes. Tools and metal shavings have routinely been left inside jets, often near electrical systems. Aircraft have taken test flights with debris in an engine and a tail risking failure. Natalie Kitroeff was one of the Times journalists on the story. We heard about a stray bolt on an engine in a plane that had already gone up for a test flight. We heard about a ladder in a tail of a plane that likewise had gone up for a test flight. Chewing gum being found holding together the trim of a door. Boeing VP Brad Zabak firing back at the New York Times in a statement to ABC News calling the story misleading, saying this article features distorted information, rehashing old stories and rumors that have long ago been put to rest. Overnight, the FAA weighing in, writing, we thoroughly investigate whistleblower complaints and take action if the allegations are substantiated. The 787 has been a very popular aircraft. It's been very safe, very successful. The New York Times report comes on the heels of Boeing's trouble with its software in their crown jewel, the 737 MAX. They've been grounded worldwide since mid-March following two crashes that killed 346 people. And we should point out several airlines who use Boeing planes have voiced their support. American, Norwegian, all saying they have confidence in the company's planes. Yeah, but when you hear about a piece of gum holding things together. Unsettling. Yes. Definitely. We do want to transition, though. Get a check of the forecast. Rob Marciano standing by. Uh, Dan has been admiring his Easter beige suit on this Easter Sunday. I just said it takes a lot of guts to pull that off, and you do it, my friend. <laughs> you know, Dan is on a pink shirt today. Yeah. Well, if there's a time to roll the fashion <laughs> dice, it's on Easter Sunday. Today's the day. There's going to be gum, there's going to be jelly beans, there's going to be chocolate, there's going to be Easter eggs, that's for sure. This is Copper Mountain. We'll start it there, which is, they claim to have a, the world's largest Easter egg hunt. It's going to be happening today. As the full moon sets on the ski season in Aspen Snowmass today, the final season there, also the final season in Sun Valley and some other spectacular places. But we do have some rain and snow showers across parts to the Inner Mountain West for that big Easter hunt and some leftover uh, rain showers here in the Northeast from that stubborn upper low that just refuses to budge. It'll keep some instability in the air, so not completely clear uh, for your Easter Sunday and Monday travel, but real nice across the midsection of the country and down across the south, a little disturbance across the northeast uh, part of the plains. And hey, let's break out the beach forecast. Why not? Temps in the 70s and 80s, water temperatures in the 60s and 70s, and that is a uh, celebration enough to get out the bouncing beach ball. That's checking your local, your national weather headlines. Here now is your local forecast. Hi, I'm ABC 7, Steve Rudin. Hope you're having a good start to your Easter Sunday morning. As you head out the door, it is a little bit on the cool side right now. Lower 50s inside the Beltway. Elsewhere, we're in the middle to upper 40s, Winchester and Leesburg. Winds not much of a problem at around 2 to 8 miles per hour. Temperatures for the morning hours, lower 60s by 11 a.m. by midday, will be in the middle 60s. We do have a chance for a few showers later on this afternoon, but not going to amount to a whole lot. Warmer tomorrow with highs around 70. I know what you're thinking. Where, where is that bouncing bunny? <laughs> <laughs> Making an appearance. Still time. I mean, you certainly know what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs>
Did you, did you used to spill some Easter egg dye? Yeah, I, I look at this. It's Don't a morning you... for contemplation, for family, for sartorial risks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there you go. Yes. We're highlighting like the colors color. of the peeps on but this Easter Sunday. We literally have all the Easter colors yeah, on exactly. today. Yeah, exactly. And Carla about. has on some white as well, so oh. we're going to have like all the... She's pink as well, so you're, we're all going to match on Bring this. it all together. Yes, very very nice. Exactly. Well, moving along. A routine traffic stop took a turn when the officer gave a helping hand instead of a ticket. ABC's Lana Zak has this story. Kayshawn Baldwin was on his way to a job interview when he saw the flashing lights of a police cruiser. His mind started reeling. Car finna get towed. I'm finna go to jail for not driving with valid license or anything like that. More tickets.